Hi there, it's Marcus here. Week seven, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, what can I say really? Um, actually, it's week six. That's what I can say. I have to uh, snap myself in the face. I said week seven because I've just been setting up the Zoom links and so on for our week sem seven seminar number two. Okay, so let's jump to that straight away. But maybe just before that little side note we look at emotions in history but as always i'm doing a kind of intertextual um thought bubble here uh love the piece by byung chun han uh on the age of whizzing and the age of marching uh i've used multiple times in my own uh writing i've referred to monique shear's piece on the habitus or the practice of emotions and so on so, you know, I just wanted to flag that. I think those are two great readings. But, you know, these readings, you may be reading them in separately or just one of them even. Uh, but really, readings need to be read in company with other readings. And so my thought bubbles are very much about saying, oh, yeah, but there's, well, I refer to Rurson in this one again. Can't get away from him because I think he really nailed certain things refer to a past colleague's work on the emotions of truth and so on. So, you know, that's that's the sort of messy brain I might have. You might consider it messy, but, uh, you know, it's it helps me do the kind of thinking and intertextual work that I really value. It brings meaning to my life. All right. So here we are, week two seminar in uh, the sorry seminar two in week seven. Maybe I should start this recording again. If I make too many more mistakes like that, I will. Um, yeah. So it's set for September the 9th, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. It might not go quite that long. There's the Zoom link. The Zoom link will also be put up on the um, under the modules for week seven. I'll also uh, send out an announcement. And just because some of you are probably looking at this gorgeous uh, image here, this is Mont Saint-Michel. It's off the coast of France, and it's in my bucket list. It's a place I'd really love to go before I drop dead, um, which might be sooner rather than later, the way I've been feeling recently. Um, not that I'm trying to worry you. you you've got uh, years ahead of you, most of you. So, Mont Saint-Michel is just this glorious medieval monastery on a little lump of rock around which, as you can see, some houses and homes are built up and so on. Uh, it can be reached by walking across the, the sandbars uh, at low tide, for instance, and there's some wonderful cinematography and f photography of that. Mont Saint-Michel, put it on your bucket list, perhaps, if you're a monastery-type geek like I am. So anyway, um, week seven, uh, I'll be hosting that particular seminar and all things being equal, I'm going to be uh, back and annoying you physically, or some of you at least. Tony's still going to be looking after the Morton Bay mob. Um, but I'll be, uh, should be back at work uh, physically uh, for, what is it, week week seven, but I'll be back in class with you guys, or some of you at least, on in week eight, all things being equal. So let's keep moving. So what, what are we going to, what am I going to thought bubble about this week? First of all, I'm going to start off, I've forgotten about this book, uh, with this wonderful book on Anglo-Saxon thinking. And the preface is fantastic. I've been following Eleanor Parker's work for a few years now. She's a terrific uh, medievalist. Uh, she's a lecturer in literature and something like that at one of the Oxford University colleges. Uh, she's really good. Uh, and she, she I, I love her on Twitter. She always posting these fantastic things on Twitter. But this comes from the preface of her book, which I've got here somewhere amongst my books. Here it is. All right. Uh, it's, it's a brand new book. It's just uh, been published in 2022. Been out only for a few weeks, but you know, I'm a bit of a geek. I'm going to get her book on Vikings as well, just because I want to see how she handles that their literature. But she starts off here with an observation. I think it's an observation that's particularly relevant for my approach to history and to thinking. Uh, 
me talking about intertextuality uh, because she starts off, uh, it states early on in, in the preface, she says, look, a famous preface, so she, it's a, she's referring to preface within her preface, I think that's pretty cool, a famous preface from Anglo-Saxon literature compares the act of the historian, I'm put that in square brackets because actually it's the act of the translator, that, that's the translator who translates these uh, Anglo-Saxon stories, poems, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, compares the act of the historian to going into the woods to collect timber, okay? You go out, you collect into the gathering materials for building and coming back laden with branches. What are we building? We're building thought castles, thought palaces. Uh, so the historian collected as much as he could carry from the original text. And he says, that he says, as in the person she's referring to who, who wrote that first preface, but still wished that this is the historian now that he could have brought back more to quote in every tree I saw something I needed at home so this is the part that you know really strikes home so this particular chronic uh, no uh, translator recommends that every reader go to the woods and the forest of books and gather for themselves and this is what I recommend you do uh, every one of these presentations that I do these little thought bubbles are filled with references to other kinds of other texts. I've got so many here, Jorn Rosen, oh, there's one that I'm not referring to, but it's a really good one, it's called Feral by Georges Monbiot. Okay, Song Lines is sitting here, you know, so I've got them everywhere, I'm just surrounded by books. Um, and books enrich my world. So that's sitting under a tree, gardening, mowing the lawn, listening to the birds, and so on. So I can't say that I am um, kind of obsessively just stuck within books. Books just enrich my world. And I'm hoping that part of what you get through doing a history major, or even just a history, um, uh, what do we call them, uh, elective, that you too come away with a deeper love of respect for the text, for books that bring in something. They can be PDFs, so they don't have to be physical books, uh, but certainly my life, I could do a biography of my life going right back to probably around my age of about six or seven uh, with just a line of books on the floor, you know, and you can see the interesting ways that my life has evolved as a life of thinking and acting, doing of course, because they dance between one another. So, I recommend to you Winters in the World. Maybe get it for, ask someone for it as a Christmas present. So, story, knowledge and emotion. The way I think about books and texts in general is that we connect our readings and the song lines beyond them. In other words, I've given you two readings for this week. Um, they might seem quite, well, they are quite diverse, disparate readings. You know, Ryung Chul Han talks about denarrativization. And, you know, he, he's doing that in the context of what does it mean to be moving from one age to another? Now, living in an age is something that we take for granted. We talk about the Renaissance, the Reformation, the medieval period, and so on, uh, and the modern period in which we live today. Perhaps you think you live in the postmodern or the post-industrial, or perhaps you've been reading stuff on, you know, the post-human, uh, and so on. Wherever you're sitting in terms of all this chronological stuff, Talking about an age, the Victorian period, the Victorian period, the, basically the 19th century, particularly as experienced by Anglo-Saxons, particularly as experienced by colonials like Australians and New Zealanders, and people in India for that matter as well, and other colonial states that were part of the British Empire. This is an age that we have a coherent narrative around. Ryung Chul Han is basically saying, look, we've moved out of that period of modernity and we're into a period of almost free fall in some respects. And that free fall is an age of what he's referring to as the age of whizzing. Some of you may have come across, especially if you've done sociology, the work of Zygmunt Bauman. So Hahn refers to Bauman 
and uses Bauman as his, you know, uh, fencing partner, you could say. Um, Bauman says this, uh, but really I think he should have said this is the way that Hahn is working. This is a philosophical strategy. You you quote someone and he stays with, you know, Bauman uh, across that short reading. But, you know, Bauman is there to help Hahn make some points. One of the points, one of the key points is that our current age, we've, we've got what you might call temporal collapse. Now, you've got to remember that this is from a really interesting book. It's a book I would be waving around uh, if I hadn't gone and lent it to one of my PhD students. Uh, so it's, you know, the scent of time, the smell of time, the scent of time. And in each of these little essays that he has in that book, and you've got the whole book there, actually, to have a look at if you wish, and they're only small books. Um, each one of these refers to scent in some way. He ends this particular reading, doesn't he, by talking about the, what is it, the scent of, um, not float, hovering. Yeah, I was thinking floating. Uh, I tend to be not particularly literal in, in my brain. I, I tend to think in terms of the intent of the author. It's one of the ways my brain works. I've noticed this over the years. So this denarrativization has created this floating, this hovering sense. So uh, he's, and you know, he refers to the flaneur. Now it was Walter Benjamin, and then even before Walter Benjamin, some of the 19th century French poets and, 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 and writers and thinkers talked about the flaneur. That's the wealthy person who lives a life of ease by and wanders around a bit like the vagabond is the other one that Hunt talks about but you know he the flaneur usually a male wanders around the streets just looking never in a rush just observing this and that uh connecting the dots sometimes but just sometimes just simply experiencing Han says that the flaneur which is uh, a, a metaphor taken up by Bowen is actually incorrect. There's too much so-called agitation. I don't think he even means he's talking about moving, he's talking about agitation. We live in an agitated period is what Han is saying. A period in which emotions also and identity are also fragmented. Now I'm going to step from Han before I get to Monique Shear at the bottom here with the fourth point. I'm going to go via this book here, wherever it is, Songlines where, um, what's her name, Margot Neal refers to a Native American uh, thinker who says the trouble with white fellas is that they keep all their brains in books. <coughs> That's these things. Okay, so yeah, it is a problem if, on, if your only textual experience is the, the experience of the written word. One of the interesting things about history in recent times is that you know many other forms of text have emerged the the textual work of archaeologists the textual work of people reading human dna especially ancient dna it's something that interests me a lot um, the textual work of you know people who look at uh, the pollen records or you know the ice caps uh, geologists uh, and so on all of this adds to the richness of historical thinking one of the guys who works at uh, USC Professor Patrick Nunn is a brilliant uh, synthesizer of different forms of text in order to uh, including indigenous songline and story to create uh, really new important and powerful readings of the past this all counts now i bring that in because you know part of the denarrativization is the fact that textual uh, chunks for most of us nowadays uh, are about the size of a twitter post or a facebook post you know um one of the uh, somebody that i know very well uh, just posted on facebook today about the indigenous uh, trade paths and said it's a long read it's about four or five paragraphs long or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, it's is that a long read? Look at this book here. That's a long read. Go off and read, a, you know, a, a serious book and it's much different. But, you know, we've lost the ability for many of us to sustain long reading. Long journey. 
journeying with a thinker through a series of thought experiments, series of, you know, uh, explorations, you'd have to say. So this brings us to Monique Shear's work. So if we've got all our knowledge, all our brains in books, this, this poses a neurological problem because when Monique Shear starts to talk about the physicality of emotions and the embodiment of emotions, we are having to shift from purely cognitive states to emotive states. You know that you're an emotional being. Each one of us is an emotional being. And sometimes we can feel irritated or we can snap at, you know, a family member or, you know, a friend or whatever. And then we might apologize because what happens is that our uh, cognitive, rational, uh, so-called objective self steps in and says, hang on a second, you can't talk like that. Uh, go and apologize or, you know, provide a apology and a re rationale for why you're saying this or that. So a neurology that is actually shaped especially in the first 10 to 20 years of our life, through the kind of cognitive and educational experiences where our bodies are trained to sit for long periods of time. We're trained to read often quite meaningless material uh, ad infinitum. Uh, and, you know, we're trained to also think that knowledge is only in books or that you're only knowledgeable if you can articulate things clearly as opposed to, what about the knowledge of feelings? What about the feeling centre? that you know uh, someone like Dempsey Bob is talking about where if we keep all our and not brains in books where do they keep theirs well if you go to the song lines book and you look at the indigenous knowing ways uh, brains are kept in country brains are kept in shared communal collectives of story and so on very very interesting so the oh, half another here I am I can wave another book this one here, 10 Presents That Changed the World. It's a really interesting book. I love his introduction. Historian who's actually writing speculatively about, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, Mahatma Gandhi, and others like that. Um, and he says, look, what do you think of when you hear the word history? Now, this guy teaches history in the US at a university there. I'm not sure which one it is now. I can tell. Check. Let me check. Uh, Santa Barbara University. Okay. Oh, no. Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara, California. So, that, you know, he's knocked out some really wonderful books. He says, of course, when we say the word history, you think of textbooks. All your brains in books, right? As Dempsey Bob said. But that's not how history has passed on in parts, in centuries past. For thousands of years, it is relayed in the form of stories. We've done a lot on narrative in this course so far, haven't we? Stories told around the campfire by the elders of the tribe while the young watched and listened, committing those stories to memory. Okay, ready for the day when they too would pass those stories on to their children and grandchildren and so on. Modern neuroscience, here's neurobiology kicking in again, hence my image on the side here, has revealed why they did that. Why the collective wisdom of a clan, a tribe or a nation, was handed down in the form of epics. Think of the Iliad and the Odyssey, as, uh, or heroic stories. The reason for that uh, is that, unlike a textbook, sorry, a story appeals to two parts of our brain instead of just the one. It appeals to our cognitive faculties, but also to our emotional intelligences. So, you know, when we start thinking about emotions in history, I always think in layers. I think about studying emotions from the past. What was it, how sad did a, 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 an ancient Greek feel when their son was carried home on his shield? That's our Spartan mother. Um, or or uh, how sad was it that, you know, people felt in London after, the, you know, the great London fire of 1666. But, and of course, that's a serious historical question. One that we can half guess at and obviously make some reasonably accurate uh, you know s historical statements as well 
But the other thing is, you know, what about the emotional intelligence of the historian themselves? I don't think you can write books like the ones I've just been waving around if you don't actually have a passionate emotional engagement with your subject matter. And I think that's just as important a question to deal with. It's a different question, but, you know, it means that the question for this week is actually double-edged, you know, and I think that's really, really interesting. Now, when you get Tony in class, ask him why he spends so much time studying what he studies. He's, you know, he is passionately involved in his PhD research. And thank God he is, because I can tell you, doing research when you're not interested is, you know, like pulling teeth. So let's move then from a discussion of our emotional intelligence and emotional commitment of historians to the to the feelings of their emotional engagement or their feelings around their subject matter to directly deal with this question of the habitus. Pierre Bourdieu, French social scientist, thinker, philosopher of the last century, I think he died around 2005 from memory, and I haven't gone and checked, I'm just pulling that date out of the air. But, you know, he, I, he really impacted me, particularly in the 1980s, when I was studying educational philosophy, because he has a lot to say about the, the conditioning of the human subject and the human mind. And this concept of habitus has been something that, you know, I go back to regularly. Um, habitus, basically, if you think of a habit, like, as in not a habit as I've got a bad habit, but as in a habit as in something that a monk would wear, it's like pulling on a cloak. It's a form of identity. Okay, an identity that you practice. Currently, you're a student. Some of you might become teachers. Others might become journalists, policy writers, who knows what. Okay, you might shoot off in some really quite unexpected direction and, um, you know, find your path in life. That whatever it is, though, that is being a student at university currently is one of the habitat that you inhabit. You live in that habitus, the student habitus. You've probably got a part-time job. You squeeze in study. You probably go out and, and drink and party too much with your friends. Uh, that's unless you're one of these mature age students who's shackled to home and children and husbands or wives and so on. Uh, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm just sort of making up hypotheticals here. So let's see what Monique Shear has to say about the habitus, because to me it's really important. If we suddenly think about emotions as a practice, one of the things we have to understand is that you practice it as a student, you practice to be a scholar, but you can, we also practice being happy, sad, uh, laughing, humour, joy, rage, and so on. All these things are learnt from our social stuff. Nature and nurture are dancing here. But certainly there's enough evidence in, from, you know, historical evidence to uh, help us understand that those Scythian Amazons that we were reading about last week, for instance, um, they inhabited a totally different world to our own for a start. And their emotional reactions would be somewhat similar in some ways, uh, might feel love and so on. Uh, but in what ways would they express that? How do you uh, inhabit an emotion like love, or fear, or hate, or loathing, distaste, and so on. So let's have a look. The body is deeply shaped by the habitus. This is a, from Pierre Bourdieu. He borrowed it from Marcel Mauss, who was a an earlier social thinker, philosopher, and they, who in turn had borrowed it from Aristotle and the Scholastics. The Scholastics are 12th century uh, philosophers like Thomas Aquinas, okay? Peter Abelard and others like that, to note, and it denoted, to quote, a system of cognitive and motivating structures. How abstract can you get? It's basically how you think and, and, and the reasons why we do things. That correspond to your social position. So a peasant, a medieval peasant, would have a different habitus to a medieval baron or lord or lady or whatever. Sound making sense? So these structures are dispositions. That means ways in which you see and orient yourself to the world, durably inculcate, uh, inculcated by the possibilities and impossibilities, freedoms and necessities, opportunities and prohibitions inscribed in the objective conditions. 
reading that makes me think of Elizabeth I of England. You know, she deliberately cultivated a certain kind of habitat. She didn't come to it straight away. It emerged around her, and she made strategic decisions about how she was going to be a woman in a man's world in 16th century England. Okay? And as she evolved that habitus, that uh, image, that persona, that was perceived by others, there were many Elizabeths there, but the, the one that was most publicly visible was a habitus of royal authority. I think that's really interesting, and a lot has been written on the, on her, her life, and the way she did that. So, you know, these are objective conditions established by society. 16th century Elizabethan world, it was quite different from today, for instance. Elizabeth would have been quite a different person uh, if she uh, had been alive today. But she would have still had some of the characteristics of a strong will, um, a, a sense that of privilege, and so on that uh, she certainly carried simply because that's the kind of person you needed to be to survive in that world. So let's continue reading this, the last few lines, and that's objectively compatible. This habit is objectively compatible with the, those conditions and in a sense pre-adapted to their demands. In other words, Elizabeth learnt in her early years to uh, not trust men. Her father probably wasn't a great role model, that was Henry VIII, okay? Um, she also learnt that to be to survive and to live, uh, she needed to uh, compromise. She was uh, a great, she made great compromises with uh, Parliament, um, the Star Chamber, for instance, in Parliament, but she also made compromises with, you know, between Catholics and Reforma Reformation uh, people, Protestants. Uh, you know, she's famous for having said, look, I'm not going to make a window into men's souls or hearts or something like that. In other words, she wasn't going to ask too many questions about or probe, are you a real Protestant or a real Catholic? She couldn't have Catholics too close to her because at that time, you know, the Church of England was new, it was, you know, uh, and, you know, Protestantism itself was very much under threat from Catholicism, and Catholics were often seen as traitors, though she did not regard her Catholic subjects as traitors. She wasn't going to go that far. Very, very interesting. Okay? So the habitus consists of schemes of perception. It's the way you see the world, thought and action. But it's not just how you see the world, it's how you act in it. And I think that's one of the things that is central to Monique Shear's argument here, that, you know, our actions produce our individual and collective practices, and that they in turn reproduce their generative schemes. In other words, chicken and the egg, they circle one another. I act like this, and the world looks like this, the world looks like that, which confirms the way I'm acting, okay? And that's the way it goes. So, what can we say about these emotions then? We learn to feel emotions by sitting around the campfire, going back to the earlier quote that I gave, the kitchen table, attending a football match, watching TV, or some mix of all of those. And now I say we, uh, we're learning that from the moment we are born through to the end of our lives. We're moving from marching, that means an ordered, stable, progress-driven society or world, to a whizzing, a time, uh, illust uh, not illustrated, a time of temporal collapse, temporal meaning duration here, okay? And we, we live with a certain amount of ahistoricity. That means the historical memory that, you know, gave people meaning and purpose in previous generations is getting increasingly thin. I'm always shocked at how much uh, students that I have, nothing personal, guys, but, you know, don't know, just think that I've taken for granted all my life. Part of that memory, that ahistoricity, uh, undermines meaning itself. We're going to come back to meaning in a little while. Um, so let's have a look then at this. Byung Chul Han makes the note. And I've start, I use the page one here because it's on the first page of the downloadable PDF. But I, I didn't use, I'm going to quote Han again. 
and I didn't put a page number for because I know it actually from having held the book that we are on you know like chapter six or seven or eight or something and of course it's page in the 40s or 50s um, anyway so I'm just flagging that because to me I, I did have to go through this kind of debate in my head as to how I'm going to paginate it so the human being elevates itself to become the subject of history this is in modernity confronted by the world as an object that can be reproduced this is this famous pa painting by Caspar Friedrich um, and you know I use this image quite a lot because to me it says so much about the the way the modern world emerged and the relationship of the human to the more than human other than human whatever we want to call it the natural world so here we have the gentleman looking out over a wild and quite mysterious landscape. The human being elevates itself to become the subject of history. In other words, we became historical, particularly in the modern period. It's why, you know, Herodotus would never have said, I'm an historian. He would see himself as a storyteller, a moral philosopher, or something like that. Interesting, isn't it? So what are we today? What are you becoming as you study history? What am I? I, I? You know, I would probably not want to describe myself as an historian. Uh, Tony's more likely to describe himself as an historian. Uh, I wouldn't describe myself as a futurist either, though I feature a lot in futurist journals and so on. Uh, for me, I'm a cultural being, and I'm particularly interested in cultural evolution and in the cross currents that occur in cultural thinking worlds. Points to consider then. My next year talks about embodied history. I think that's a really interesting one. Barbara Rosenwein, uh, historian of uh, multiple things, but yeah, she's also a historian of the emotions. Uh, she talks about the managed heart. In other words, the conditioned heart. Embodied history is about the way every historical period produces people of a certain kind. Uh, we are not people of the 20th century, even though I lived more than half of my life in the 20th century. Um, we are people of the 21st century, experiencing COVID, climate change, uh, the rise of fascism there, uh, again, uh, as well as, you know, polarisation. We're experiencing uh, everything from the optimisms of cultural movements like solar punk and so on through to, you know, dark uh, dystopic visions as sold to us by television and movies and so on. So, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing. But so our bodies are historical. They carry within themselves at a cellular level, at a conditioned level, uh, the qualities of the present that mark each decade, each generation, with a certain kind of world orientation. Historians often, and, and, and cultural people in popular culture do it as well, we often tend to periodize the past. That's the Renaissance, that's the Middle Ages, and so on. Finding the right kind of narrative. Okay, how do we explain the Middle Ages? Oh, we'll do this, that, and that. Even Hans' denarrativization, of course, we have to understand, is a narrative, which is one of the ironies that I'm sure he's aware of. He's a, he's a very savvy character. Did you look him up? Did you see that he's a Korean-born um, uh, German citizen now who teaches uh, philosophy at, at one of the great universities in Berlin somewhere, I believe? Okay, a very interesting guy. So, he, you know, his denarrativization is a narrative of sorts. The thinking is important, okay, to think with and between Monique Scheer and Bjorn Chulhan is really what I'm trying to do here and demonstrate it to you. So, getting close to the end of this uh, thought bubble. So, I often in this particular week, when we start dealing with emotions, turn to my friend and former colleague at USC, Francesco Riccati, who wrote this amazing paper. I'm pretty sure it's in the extended readings. I should put up the Rosenvine as well, if it's not there, but I think it is there. Um, he wrote about truth as an emotion, that actually our sense or our attachment to truth is an emotional attachment, but also that truth has the same 
uh, effect on our neurobiology as, uh, as any emotion does. And he says, look, if we assume that truth and therefore historical truth is an emotion, we also have to think that uh, we have to work with it uh, uh, methodologically. How do we deal with, you know, in our quest for truth? And this is something really interesting in terms of our quest for objectivity. You know, uh, how do we find our way into that? And of course, methodology is at the, in the background of all historical practice. The methods we use to kind of approach truth, as we might say. So whatever the methodology is, he goes on, he says, look, this would need to expose the limitations of a teleological interpretation. Look down below, teleology, the explanation of phenomena in terms of the purposes that they serve. Okay, and I think of Herodotus and his great introduction to his huge, wonderful book on the histories. So we would, this would need to expose the limitations of a teleological interpretation. In other words, looking at things or studying history from the point of view of the purposes that it serves. So the modern world has helped human beings reduce poverty and violence and disease. So that's a teleological statement. And if you, if you accept those as truths, then the way you work your historical sort of narration of the past few centuries uh, is one in which we're fighting against ignorance and, you know, superstition. We're moving out of the medieval world as a world uh, of where everything is a mystery to a scientific world where, and so you get what I'm saying, okay, blah, 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 off we go. So the, it's designed to actually challenge the teleological nature of historical thinking and working, um, it, linking causes and effects based on factual evidence. I attempt uh, to contribute to the development of such a methodology by retelling and reflecting on personal uncanny encounters. Now, Francesco is not the only person to use that term uncanny. Uncanny is uh, a... European philosophical concept that challenges uh, the objective, the straightforward. You can't say that the First World War started because Archer Franz Ferdinand was knocked off by, you know, a crazy Serb um, in what 1914, you know, assassinated. We can't do that. It's too simplistic a narrative. All right. Uh, we can't say that um, the Second World War started because of the Versailles Treaty and, you know, the uh, imposition of uh, debt recovery on the Germans that uh, crippled the German economy for, uh, and society for 15 years plus, right? We can't. Those sorts of explanations are too simple. That's what Francesco is saying. His approach is to retell and sto personal stories He's an oral, oral historian, okay? Um, he goes out and he interviews uh, Australian and Italian immigrant families and so on. Uh, and he, he works with a different, what you'd call epistemic lens. In other words, a, a way of creating knowledge or insight into the world, uh, but uh, from not using traditional historical tools. So Francesco, just as a, a, a note, is not some crazy guy off on, you know, left of field. He, he went from our university, USC, to Murdoch, and he's now uh, being picked up by the Australian National University. So his star is rising. He's a, he's a fantastic guy, but he's also a really good thinker. And I think there's a lot to be got from having a look at how he approaches emotion and truth. So I promise we'd get back to meaning. This is, I think, the second last slide from Ford. So going, turning to your lesson now, good old John, he talks about meaning grows out of context. This is towards the end of his book. Okay, this is not in... Um, oh, you do, I think, have access to the book through the, through the extended readings. But he says, look, meaning is communicative, it's relational, and it's disciplined. That's really important. The relationality, the fact that we, as academics, scholars, historians, whatever you want to call us, uh, have an emotional field of, that's a communicative praxis, is there? And it's something that Francesco is talking about with his, his own retellings. 
But this quote, I think, really sums up something that I'm trying to get to. Rosen says, all these dimensions of meaning are communicative and therefore interactive. That means we have a community. This was one of the problems for David Irving, wasn't it? He, he thought historians were a bunch of idiots and he didn't need to pay any attention to what they said. Science, and, and of course here he's thinking historical science as well, can be understood as an intersection of this reciprocal interpretation of dimensions through time and space. In academic study, meaning is conceptualized through research, explicated at an argumentative level, how well do we tie our thinking together, how logical, how coherent it is, but also it is criticized, subject to peer review, and, oh, I found a new piece of evidence about this, or that person has found a new piece of evidence, they won't undermine it, I have to say, oh yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm going to have to modify, if not retract, what I just said. I like that. So, going back to Lung Chul Han, this is the last slide. Freedom in history, he talks about, and this is relational as well, one feels free in relationships of love and friendship. It is not the absence of ties, but ties themselves that set us free. The emotion of love, the sense of belonging, the sense of community, the sense of being part of an historical and his, a tradition, a historical tradition, a tradition in which historians have built a meaningful context in which to do their work. We might disagree with historians. We might fight tooth and nail with them. But they, we, all contribute to a community in which we should, you know, uh, if the historian is doing, uh, is worth their salt, i.e. is following the historian's craft, is applying historical methodologies and so on, they may come up with different conclusions, but if you can't fault them on that, and of course David Irving was criticised, and basically he's not considered an historian. I wonder if that's showing up on, uh, on your screen, I don't know. Um, you know, but however we go about it, there's a relationality at work here. How we understand relationships, according to Monique Shear, is a practice. A disciplinary practice, as well as a practice of the heart, of the body. All right? And I think all of that comes together in some kind of meaningful way where we don't want to have answers, but we want to have a sense that emotions, the historian's emotions, the his the sub the emotions of our the historical subject Queen Elizabeth the first for instance we know she was in love with some of her a couple of her courtiers over the long period she was in uh, in her play but you know that love is and how she handled it is part of what makes her such an interesting historical subject there we go so thank you very much I know this was a bit of a, a rambling thought bubble but it's to me I I don't think we can just sit back and come up with answers. We have to do this kind of feeling into the subject. We, we have to understand that our feeling into is an emotional enterprise as much as it is a cognitive enterprise. We have to be rational as well as... Our emotions are rational? I don't think so. So you can't say rational and irrational, but we need to find more holistic ways of handling the world around us and coming up with an historical practice. Perhaps this is where Inga Clendinen was going with her work on the Holocaust. Okay, thank you very much.